The Mountain Movers Church to me is family. It's family. Love. Friendships. Life changed. Home. At this church, we're just all about loving people. We're just about being real. It's about relationships. It's not about religion. I believe we all have something that God has called us to do. We make uh, this thing called Christianity be way too complicated. It's very simple. It it's about loving God. Our mission at Mountain Movers Church is to lead people into a real and a life-changing relationship with Jesus that's contagious. Day. We're going to be celebrating with game day, and game day is an NFL day. It's an opportunity for you to invite your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, and people you don't even know. Go get them. Invite them to come out for one hour of a life-changing experience. You're doing so good. You're doing so good. I told him, like, either do it or shut up. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, about to do explode. it yourself. We've got Steve Green yeah, coming. Steve Sorry. We're very excited to hear him. He's going to bring the word next week. He's going to share with you his own personal experiences of playing in the NFL as a believer and how that can just apply to us in our life. We're also going to have outside, we're going to have a tailgate party. It is not going to look the same next week, so make sure you follow our parking team and where to park your car. And I'll just tell you, if you come in on this side, don't come in that side door or you're going to miss all the awesome right. action. You're going to want to come around be cool. because the tailgate party is going to be out it's here. Be on this side. All right? So it's going to be awesome. We're also going to have a best-dressed fan competition with cash prizes like $100 cash Ooh, price. So it's going to be well worth no. you digging out your face paint and your uniform or right. your whatever That's uniform right. that you would wear if you were going to a ball game. Yes. Right? Because we all wear uniforms at ball games. Yes, so we do. I was talking to Steve the other day and he is so excited whatever to be in Grove and I was, I was kind of breaking the news to him that he had to preach three times and he said, what? What? He said, I didn't know there was a mega church in Grove, Oklahoma. <laughs> Man, I am excited. I didn't tell him the room was the size of some people's living room. Uh, that's not He's that's gonna the find little that details, you know, but he is so pumped to come and see us. That's right. So take your Make invites sure out. We challenge you to invite 10 people to celebrate 10 years and bring them in next week for game day. That's right. So wasn't long ago, 1997, in February of 1997, I made a decision. I made a decision that the pain I would experience in changing my life to please God was much, much more attractive than the pain I had been living with trying to please myself. And it wasn't long after that, after I gave my life to Jesus, it wasn't long after that in 1998 that God called me to a full-time ministry focus. He began to pull my heart. He began to show me that so many people in life have these obstructions that are keeping them from being able to see what he has for their lives. Those obstructions were mountains. And he said, everybody's got mountains. He said, some mountains keep people from having an intimate relationship with me. Some mountains keep people from having an unbelievable marriage. Mountains that keep people from having health, wealth, and wisdom, and, and all sorts of things. Uh, ultimately, an unbelievable blowout ministry that he's called us all to on some level or another. He showed me that people have mountains. And all at one time, he showed me a problem and a solution. And that moment, I remember that moment, and he just planted this little seed of excitement in my heart that eventually gave birth, and today we all know it as Mountain Movers Church. So unbelievably cool. It wasn't long after that that I met Misty, and, and let me just tell you, man, fireworks happened when we met. 
I'm just telling you. I mean, you, get, you got this guy that's a dreamer and this girl that's a doer. You got this guy that loves strategy, and this girl can make the plan happen. She can make it happen. When we got together, man, it was crazy. We began to dream together. We began to pray together. We began to have long, drawn-out discussions about what our life would look like, what our ministry would look like. And as you can see, after many, many years of dreaming, it finally became a reality. And I, I want to show you this. Steve Jobs said this. He said, if you are working on something exciting that you really, really care about, you don't have to be pushed. The vision pulls you. Helen Keller, many of us know who she is. Tremendous, tremendous story. She was deaf and blind. And she said this, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight and no vision. Let me tell you, vision is exactly what it took in the very beginning for Misty and I to begin to see the dream that God had birthed in our hearts to become a reality. But we learned this very, 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 very quick. Vision without action is just a dream. Have you ever met people that they, they like to talk about their dreams? Like, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I want to have this, and I want to have this, and you never see it happen. Because if you just dream, but you don't have vision, and you don't get to work, it's never going to happen, whether it's in your personal walk with God, in your spiritual life, with your family, with a business, or in this case, with a ministry. You have to have vision and get some action behind it. In fact, Misty and I think that one of the greatest tragedies that anyone can experience is that, is that they would have lived this life never having fulfilled the purpose, the vision that God had birthed inside them from the very beginning while they were here on planet Earth. The Bible says in Proverbs 29 and verse 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. All right? Life is about purpose. We all have a purpose. You and I have a purpose, and believe it or not, our purpose is the same. It's, it's this, and it's very simple. To know God and to make Him known. To know God, to have a real intimate relationship with Him, and to be contagious with it. In fact, we converted that into our mission statement, which many of you know. I hope you know. If you don't know, stick around and you will know it. But it goes something like this, to lead people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus that is contagious. A mission is so important because it, help us, it helps us to be mindful. It helps us to stay on track, on focus. It, it, it helps us to kind of bring it back, reel it in, and say, why are we here? Why are we doing what we are doing? And that's not just for a church. That's for you as an individual, for you as families, business owners. A mission statement is so powerful because it reminds us why we exist, and it keeps us true, and it keeps us on track track for the direction that we are heading. Let me tell you something about the direction we're heading, and this pushes us, this pushes us, and this drives us. It's, it's, it's in Jude uh, chapter 1, verse 23. It's all about saving people, snatching them from the fire of hell. People ask me, when they ask me what I do for a living, I say, I sell fire insurance. <laughs> like, really? That's inter- just fire insurance. Yeah, pretty much just fire insurance, right? I'm telling you, and it drives us. It pushes us. It, it pull, Like Steve said, it, it pulls us into the future, and it causes us to never, ever, ever, ever want to quit because you want to know what we keep in front of us at all times? There are people that are hurting. There are people that are hopeless. There are people that are helpless. And unless we utilize our gifts, our time, and our talent for the glory of God, those people may never come to know Christ like we have come to know him, and they'll never have heaven as their home. That's right. I had somebody ask me one time, don't you ever just want to sit on your front porch and sip a glass of tea? On a rocking I'm like, chair. not really. No. <laughs> not really, because there are people dying and going to hell, and it fuels the fire with inside of our soul every single day, every single day, and we hope that we're pouring that out here. I want to take you back to the very beginning. Some of you guys may have heard some of the stories some of you may never have heard our story, and some of you today, we're going to retell a couple really funny stories um, from the beginning that I would never want to relive, all right? Never. You know, if you ever look back at your past, there's some people that are like the good old days. I would love to go back to the good old days. We don't want to go back. That? 
<laughs> we don't want to go back to the last 10 years, all right? But we're going we're gonna to show you how God worked the last 10 years and the miracles that came about and the hard times and, and what the good we learned. times and what we learned what and we what learned. we never want to go back to, all That's right? right. So last week we told you about how God told us Grove. One night driving down I-44, Brad sees a sign. It says Grove Afton Exit. He says, take me down that road. I am like, not happening. It's 2 a.m. We're going home to Joplin. He's like, turn off. So we did. Catch your phone. All right. So, <laughs> so we knew it was Grove. Listen, that was 2001. I want to tell you that when God begins to birth a dream inside of your heart, it doesn't mean his time is right now. It was 2006 before we actually came here and even got anything started. Five years passed. In that five-year time period, we helped four different churches. We didn't sit around doing nothing, crying, God, why won't you let us go to Grove? We were worship pastors in three different churches, and then we were kids pastors in a local church not too far from here for two years, and we gave everything we had into those ministries. We traveled around the United States doing kids camps all summer long and doing children's ministry conferences as we helped other churches grow their kids' ministry. And then in December 2005, Brad came to me and he said, he had just got done praying, and he said, God just told me June 2006 is the time. He's releasing us to go plant our church. So we gave six months resignation to the church we were at, and we made plans to start what you now know as Mountain Movers. We started with this little group right here. This was it. We started with a big vision and four little babies, and all no, right? And no money. <laughs> and no money. Very little money. We sold our home in Joplin. We bought a mobile home in cash and a minivan in cash, which I swore I would never drive or never Sweet live in. Sweet minivan. Do not ever tell God what you won't do, because he will make you do it. I promise. All right? I said I would never do it, and I, I did it. All right? And so we came here, and we started in this mobile home, and we started having Bible studies with one family. That family, believe it or not, is still here today. That family right. is Monty and Kathy Keith. Kathy's sitting up here on the front row. Right here on the it's front part row, Part of our leaders today. Give them a hand. Yeah. It really is unheard of. You may not know much about church planting, but most of the time, the people you start with do not stay for the long haul. And Monty and Kathy have been with us 10 years. But every Sunday morning, we would come together and we'd have a Bible study in our living room. And during the week, Brad and I would invite people to church all the time. And they were like, Where, where's it at? We're like, well, it's in our, it's in our living room. Our living we room. didn't tell them it was a mobile home. You know, we were just like, it's in our living room. And they're like, that's kind of weird. We're like, well, it's not really weird. Like, we're just getting started. We're building a team. And they're like, what do you do, stand in a circle and, like, sing songs? We're like, no, that's not what we do. So we spent. Like you have no vision. You have no vision. Where are you? <laughs> so we spent a lot of hard times in the beginning building this team, having a Bible study, and at the same time looking for a building because nobody wanted to come to a living room, all right? And so we went to the school boards. We went to the library board. We went to the senior citizens building, and we said, can we have church? We'll rent out your building. And every one of them said, no, no double no. Do you have children? No. What? We've been burned by church plants. We don't want any part of it. We're like, what in the world? God, why'd you tell us to come to Grove? Nobody wants us here. So we kept having Bible studies. In October of 2006, I had to get my date right. October 2006, the landlord of this property came to me and she said, hey, I know that you guys are looking for a building. I know that you guys want to have church. She said, my mom lives in the little white farmhouse, and she's going to be moving. And if you guys want to lease this property and those buildings, this was the beautiful property right here, you guys would be welcome to. Now, I didn't laugh in front of her, all right? I have more cooth than that. But when I left, I came home to Brad, and I was like Sarah in the Old Testament when she found out she's going to have a baby when she was like 90-some. And I started laughing, and I said, can you believe they would think that we would have church in this old farmhouse? Like, there's no way. That's not what we're looking for. Like, we came to the lake. You know what I'm saying? We came to Grove. We had a spot on the lake picked out. We wanted yeah. to build a church on the lake yeah. in Grove, not in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a field, So what if the land is $2 million? It's all right. 
So what? So what? God has the cattle on a thousand hills, right. right? God will drop it out. Didn't do it. Well, weeks went by, and we were just praying, and we're crying out, God, give us a building. Do you know Don't what you're you doing? Us? Do you know what you're doing? Why'd you send us here? And he would just kept saying, I gave you a building. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. You ever argue with God? Man. Doesn't go well. We were like, okay, fine. This is it. This is the only door you're going to open. Whatever. You're God. We are not. Let's go look at it. Green Acres is the place to be. <laughs> Farm living is the life for me. Go ahead. So Brad and I went in the front doors of the little farmhouse, and we began to look around. Sweet, isn't it? And we were like, wow, it needed a lot of work. Some paint. <laughs> some paint. It needed some walls knocked out. It was a three-bedroom house with a bathroom. The garage, you could have pushed it, and it would have just fallen over. It needed some structural help, if that's a word, and it needed a remodel. It needed Jesus. If you remember Brandy's offering, you know that we are not gifted to do any kind of remodel, construction, any of that, all right? And remodeling something takes money. That's right. We didn't have a lot of that. We barely had enough to pay our bills. And so we were like, okay, God, if this is really you, then you're going to have to provide the money to remodel this because we don't have it. And you can't go get a loan when you don't have anything. You know what I'm saying? They're like, where's your 20% down? We don't have it. What do you own? Very little. Bye-bye. You know what I'm saying? This is going to be God. And so this was in January that we made the decision to go ahead and sign a contract. And we said, draw it up. We'll sign it. On January 12th, 2007, if you lived in this area, you know we got hammered with an ice storm. An ice storm so bad that many people had to leave their homes because we didn't have power for like 17 days, some people even longer. But Brad and I, the first morning that this ice storm happened, we walked out of our home to assess the damages, and we found that our garden shed in the back had been completely demolished by a tree. And our van, which that time wasn't even a minivan, man. It was a 15-passenger. Awesome, <laughs> awesome blue 15-passenger van that we traveled in because we did kids' camps all the time. So we came out to find that that thing had a huge limb bashing in the side. The whole front windshield was busted out. And we were just like, really? Like, you couldn't just make the limb fall the other way. You're God. What are you doing to us? We already don't have the money to remodel, and now you've destroyed our things. All right. So we're like, okay, thank you, Jesus. And all thanks give thanks, right? So. That's not exactly how it went. But kind of. You get the idea. <laughs> After about the first five hours of whining, then we came around to our senses like God's in control. God's in control. Sometimes you've got to preach to yourself. Nobody was there. God's in control. And so we signed the lease to this property on February 1st, 2007 with no money to remodel. All right? Now we have a bashed-in van and garden shed. The insurance agents come out. They give us all the details. We get the estimates. And we find out that we're going to get eight thousand dollars back in march we now looked to, at the guy to two people that were broke eight thousand dollars was a lot awesome. of money <laughs> that was more yeah. money than we'd ever had in our That's bank right. account Come and on. so we were like we don't need to fix that van like we can drive without a windshield who It'll cares still move. you know what i mean it will go we don't need Is a garden legal? shed nor do we need all the crap that was in there so just get rid of that whole thing all right we looked at the guy and we weren't about to do anything dishonest we looked at the agent and we said do we have to it's fix true. our van and fix the garden shed with this money? He kind of looked at us funny, and we said, we're pastors. We're planting a church. You see that white farmhouse right over there? We want to remodel that, but we don't have any money. We think that God bashed in all of our stuff to give us this money so we can remodel. And he was like, you can do whatever you want with that money. He said, it's up to you. You can't make another claim on your stuff. You can do whatever you want. We're like, okay. thank you, sir. We waited for the check to come in the mail. We hired contractors to come in and demolish all the walls, and we started remodeling that little, tiny farmhouse. <clears throat> I pulled some trim off. Yeah, pulled up some nasty carpet. And in the meantime, 
We started a daycare out of our home. We started a home daycare as a way of making money and meeting families in our community. And when we got done with having a home daycare, we moved that daycare into the building and we opened a daycare center. All right? It means more children is basically all it means and way more paperwork. I was the director of the daycare. We hired employees to work with every age group. We had a preschool. And Monday through Friday, our daycare was set up. All right? It looked like a daycare. Cubbies, every individual space, the little tables, and the children that would come every single day. We had 35 to 50 kids every single day here at this little tiny building. We soon began, the business was growing, growing, growing. We didn't have the money, but we needed to remodel the garage and make a preschool over there. So it wasn't long until we remodeled that building. We built the hey, office. Hey, there's Caden. There's Caden. Yeah. Anybody recognize Some that of you guys guy? will recognize Caden someone. Forbes, yeah. Caden is a freshman in high school now, and he's an intern here at this I'll church. I'll never forget, he came up to me one morning. We were going to go horseback riding, Monkey Island Trails, and he comes up and he says, They were so excited. Pet the bread, pet the bread. We're going right back hoarding. So we're going, what? what? We're going what? Right back hoarding. I'm like, right. Oh, he's excited. He <laughs> we're, is. Going, <laughs> we're going horseback riding. Kate. That's, That's what I Right back hoarding. That's right. <laughs> well, on the first Sunday in September 2007, we started having church in that little farmhouse. And we, over the next two years, would learn the hard way that growth came at a price. I want you to think about this, and I want you to write it down if you're taking notes. Growth comes with a price, whether it's personally in your own life. If you want to go beyond where you are right now, you got to pay the price. If you want to grow in your relationship with God, you got to pay the price. If you want your business to grow, you got to pay the price. And if you want a ministry to grow, we had to pay the price. Now, times were better than they were before, but times were still rough. When we were, they were comparing very rough. times to what we experienced in the mobile home, it was great to have a bigger room and have people in there actually with chairs lined up in rows, but it was still small and it was very, very challenging. I remember one morning in particular, we had been trying to catch this mouse for days. Somehow he ended up in, in the house and we could not get rid Somehow. of this. Somehow. <laughs> it wasn't real There's secure. lots of holes. All right, so... He made it in, and we had some mouse traps set up, and, and I remember we were coming to the... Pause. They weren't humane kind. They weren't the kind that you run in and it snatches you. They were the old-fashioned, like... Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, inhumane traps. All right, go ahead. Those so, were cheaper. So, at the end of the, the message, I remember, man, it was quiet. It was a very somber, solemn moment. It this got really, so really true. quiet. I think I may have had tears, maybe. I was passionate about what we were preaching about. It was quiet. And all of a sudden, we hear, rap, followed by, and imagine we're trying to give an altar call while the mouse is dying, uh, right? And, and that was Mighty Mouse. I'm sure of it. We caught Mighty Mouse because the, he would not die for like two minutes. Seriously. And then just when he stopped, everybody was like, oh. it was like, oh, geez. you should have seen people's faces. It was, it was horrible. At first I was like, what? And then it was like, oh, you realize that we awful. were killing an animal right in the building but the, during an altar call. The, the, you know, we, in those days, man, it was so exciting because we saw so many different types of people coming through this little farmhouse. And one Sunday, uh, someone by the name of Mary Jane visited because we went to the bathroom after service was over. And, and I went in the bathroom. I was like, oh, what is that? Somebody has been smoking some Mary Jane in the bathroom during the service. And then some, some were like, oh, really? And I was like, that's awesome. Yeah, we'd rather be here that than anywhere else. That is exactly else. the kind of people that we're going exactly. after. Mission accomplished. That's right. That's great. Love so it. for the next two years, on Friday night, we would tear everything out of that little farmhouse that was, that was now a daycare center. Horrible. We would carry it all from that building all the way out to what used to be a field, and there was a container out here. And we would pack it up like we were moving, and we would haul it all 
we didn't have a truck, mind you. That's why we're packing it, all right? So we take it all the way from there, walk it all the way across the field, and put it in a container. And out of the container, we would bring all the chairs, 50 chairs, and pianos, and instruments, and sound systems, and we'd set it all up for the church. Then Sunday, man, we'd do church. I just had, a second ago, Lacey Hilburn's been with us for years. She goes, Misty, look what I found in my Bible. This is a bulletin from January 7, 2008, when we had printed these. And, I mean, we had no money, but we were printing full-color bulletins. Right, I remember baby. Monty said, why excellence are you doing that? And we were like, excellence in everything. We are going to give God our very, very best, even if we don't have very the very, much. very little that we have. But we would tear it down, and I remember, you know, some days it was like we were pumped up, and we were excited, and we'd pack that stuff out there. We're like, yes. And other days it was snowing, and it was 32 degrees. And, and other muddy. days it was raining. And it didn't matter. That building had to be unloaded, and the church had to be set up. And I remember we would be trucking it across the field, and those four little kids you saw in that picture would be like little baby chicks following me crying. I hate that no, numbers. No, Can't we just go home? And they're crying, and I'm crying, and Brad is like, God, what are you doing to my family? But every Sunday... When we said, do you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, hands would go up. And we would go back to our mission statement, and we would say, God, you called us here to lead people into a real and a life-changing relationship with Jesus. We won't quit. We won't quit. And this scripture would come to us, Galatians 6 and 9. So let us not get tired of doing what is good, because at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. We weren't about to give up. In October 2010, I'm sorry, August 2010, that building had packed out, man. We had no more space. We started renting Turkey Ford's gym and their cafeteria, and we were having services there on Wednesday. We had to build, but we had very little money. We took out a loan for $25,000 and said, we're going to do the rest in cash, and we broke ground on what the building is you're sitting in right now. In September of that same year, 2010, we began to pour the slab when we went to pour the slab, something awesome happened. Will you tell us? Yeah, so earlier that afternoon, I was standing uh, out in the middle of the, the mix as they were pouring the concrete. And I remember saying to my pastor friend that was there, I said, man, I just I, I see this, what is going to be a sanctuary, and I just see a, a, a wheat field, just a harvest field of many, many people that are going to come to Christ. It's just so exciting. And later that day, just hours later, as the concrete was setting up and the guys were doing the finishing work, one of the guys came up to myself and her dad and said, hey, I think the kids got into the concrete because there's like some sunflower seeds in the mix at the end of the, the, um, the cap there. It sounded and, like something our children would do, yeah, so said, we rushed. Yeah, absolutely. I'm like, I'm not surprised. So, so her dad pulls his pocket knife out and we began picking out these little seeds and, and he holds them in the palm of his hand and he's looking at them. And we both agreed very quickly that those weren't sunflower seeds. They were wheat grain. And we're like, where did wheat grain come from? Why on earth would this be in the concrete? And then we began to look, and, and it, was, it was all over that spot. And we began to look up a little bit and realize that it was further than just that spot. And we began to walk around the edges of the concrete. And as the concrete was setting, the, the, the wheat grain was settling there to the top of the surface. It was coming to the top, and it was all over the slab, except this was a 60 by 40 slab, and from 40 feet from that corner to that corner, every square inch of the pour was covered in wheat grain. And when you got to where the wall is now, just past that wall, there wasn't one grain of wheat, not one. And it just blew our mind. God, wow, wow. What an awesome promise that you truly are going to use this room as a harvest field. Many, many people will come to Christ. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, year after year after year, Sunday after Sunday, many, many people have been snatched right from hell and given the hope of heaven as their home. Amen. Amen. Give God a praise. One of the things that Brad and I did, and we were very good at then that we are not so good at now, that we're trying to get better at, is we used to journal everything happening because there were so many miracles happening, and it was hard times, but it was good times at the same um, exact time. And so after we poured the slab, two weeks later, we had a Wednesday night service at Turkey Ford, and the place was 
packed. We'd brought in a power team, and we'd never seen so many people come to this little community. And all the bleachers were full, and we had people sitting all over the floors, and we were like, man, God, this is so awesome. We were so excited about what God was doing. The very next day started our three days of fasting, all right? And so the very next day, I wrote in my journal, and I want to read you what I wrote, because once that slab was poured, here's how we were going to go forward. We were going to do phase by phase through this entire project in cash. And so we poured the concrete, and there was very little money left. We didn't have the money to stand the walls up. We had close to enough, but we were lacking $3,000. $3,000 might as well have been a million to this little church. And so I began on my fast to write this. The very next day, Thursday the 30th, we began our three-day fast for the month of October. Out of nowhere, I began to feel completely hopeless and helpless, numb and depressed. I can't say I've ever really felt this way before. Although God has been working mightily, I feel like I just want to die. I wrestled all day with these feelings, and by 5 o'clock, I went home to my room. I had been at the daycare as the director doing my job. I laid across my bed and began to sob. I refused to complain or say, woe is me, because God had done so much for us. But still I felt trapped like the world was spinning and I couldn't make it stop. As I prayed, I simply made myself declare, God, I know that you are in control and you're able to bring me through this wretched trial. I knew I was being attacked, yet I felt helpless to fight. All I could do was cry and say, God, bring the victory. Yet I refused to complain and cycle in the wilderness like the children of Israel. Still numb, I decided to go hold my kids and watch Kung Fu Panda. That movie was new then. Part of my depression was feeling like a failure as a mom for having so little time to give my children. The ministry had taken every waking moment. 30 minutes after sitting down, I heard a knock on the door. Then as I opened the door, my son, AJ, comes through the door with one of our church families right behind him. Now feeling even more humiliated that I've been caught trying to relax, which was a crime in my mind, I greeted them, hoping they wouldn't notice my sloppy makeup from all my tears today. As I opened the door, they handed me a check. I was shocked again as I heard them say, we want to build this church. I opened the check to see the check was for $3,000, the exact amount of money we needed to stand the building up. I said, wow, God, as tears began to well up again, Satan, you're such a liar. And the attack had come to an end, and the victory was won. God had once again proved himself faithful. The next few years, it took us three years to do phase by phase in cash the building that you're in today. It was a long haul, and there were times when you just got so frustrated, but then we would watch God do a miracle. And if you went through our journals last night and this last week, I've read all of them with tears running down my face as I remember so vividly the feelings that we had in those moments and then watching God come through from moving into this room with concrete floors, stud walls, no bathrooms. There was just pipe coming up when we moved in here. We set up tables over those pipes to keep you from tripping, and we served coffee off of them right where the toilets were going to sit. I mean, we had to make the best of what we had. We were out of room back there. And phase by phase, we put sheetrock on the walls. We framed in the bathrooms. We brought in plumbers. The final thing I'll never forget was putting in bathroom stalls, and it cost $3,000 for bathroom stalls. We were like, forget stalls, like like co-ed. I mean, not co-ed. Wow, that was weird. (laughs) Co-ed. It's a different kind of church. Not co-ed, just like doubles, whatever. Not co-ed. That's weird. (laughs) And I'll never forget. What's up, sister? (laughs) Is this your first day? Welcome. It's where first impression started. It's right there. It's good. I'll never forget when somebody wrote that final check. One person, they came out of that bathroom. They were somewhat new, and they said, why don't you have bathroom stalls here? And I said, that's a good question. I mean, I'd been here like just a very few times. And I said, honestly, everything we're doing, we do it in phases as the money comes in. I said, we just haven't raised enough money to put in the stalls yet. But when we do, this building will be finished. And she said, we'll take care of that today. Wrote a $3,000 check, handed it over, and the next week we ordered the stalls. We watched God move through this entire church plant. And I'm telling you, God's not 
finished yet. That's right. Again, you know, vision without action is just a dream. And we have to be willing to pay the price, sacrifice, right? That's all of us. Not, not just this church, but each and every one of us in our individual lives and in our families. We have to be willing to pay the price and never give up, to persevere, and never give up on the dream that God has birthed in your heart. Will you stand up with us today? You know, I think what's most exciting of all as we look back is to think about what's ahead. We think about all that he's done. We think about how faithful God has been. We think about how many times he's provided when it seemed so impossible. And, you know, it just reaffirms for us as we reflect that God is able to do all things. If we'll just believe, if we'll just work hard, if we'll just focus on loving him and loving people, there's no telling what more God will do. I want to pray today. And as I pray, I want to pray that each and every one of us would do our part to contribute to this thing called Mountain Movers Church, that it truly would become ultimately what God had intended it to be when he first birthed it in my heart as that little seed of hope and vision. Would you pray with me today? Father, in the powerful name of Jesus, we come before you and Lord, we say thank you. Thank you, God, for the dream of moving mountains in people's lives. Thank you, God, for the vision you've given this church to rescue people from hell, helping them to make heaven their home. God, I pray that together as a church, we would continue to use, utilize our time and our talents in such a way, God, that we would bring glory to your name. God, that we would touch the hurting and the helpless and the hopeless. God, that we would not only reach this community, but we would reach the globe for your glory. We thank you, God, because we know without faith it's impossible to please you. And we believe that with you, all things are possible. And there's so many more mountains that need to be moved. We can't wait for what's to come. The best is yet to come. With your head still bowed and your eyes closed, I just want to tell you that the vision that God birth in our hearts only came as a result of having a real relationship with God and it truly changed our life. That's been the fuel that that pushes us because we understand what it's like to be far from God but then to surrender your life and have God begin to speak to you on a daily basis and have the word of God come to life and watch your life and your family change right before your eyes. And today I want to give you that opportunity If you don't have that real and life-changing relationship with Jesus, today you can. I'm going to count to three, and when I do, I'm just going to ask that you would just raise your hand. No one else is looking around. This is just a symbol between you and God and your pastors that today you want to make that decision. Today, you want to invite Jesus to give you a new life, a real relationship with him. If that's you today, will you just raise your hand when I count to three? Then we're going to pray together as a family. One, two, three. Who are you today? Amen. I see your hand. Amen. The best decision I ever made, amen, was when I said yes to Jesus. I want a real life-changing relationship. Church, will you pray together with us? Father God, I love you. Father God, I love you. I thank you for sending your son, Jesus. I thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Jesus, I ask that you would come into my heart. Jesus, I ask that you would come into my heart. That you would forgive me of my sins. That you would forgive me of my sins. I want you to give me a real relationship with you. I want you to give me a real relationship with you. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Will you give a hand to those that just made that decision? Church, that's what it's all about. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online, or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma, 
888-647-74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.